Okay, well, it's nice to see a reasonably sized crowd, better than we, we expected. Um, <clears throat> so I'm Libro Andriati. I'm uh, responsible with Nadir El Ahiji to for this uh, for this event. Um, uh, we basically have two ideas. Uh, there was two I the general idea was to kind of explore this uh, connection that we uh, write about uh, between architecture and phantasmagoria. Uh, in our book, uh, if possible, going so far as to address some of the arguments that we try to set down in it about, uh, about uh, uh, the phantasmagoric aspect of contemporary architecture, about uh, um, the effects of technology on perception, uh, the critique of the society of the spectacle. These are some topics that we might hopefully be able to kind of uh, touch on. But more generally, um, our goal is kind of to reflect on the possibility that the concept of phantasmagoria, which has a long history, has quite developed discourse around this concept, might help us to understand our contemporary conditions, so to speak, we could say, um, forms of contemporary, contemporary experience, including the experience of the city. Um, so, Basically, the question for us to know whether this word or this term phantasmagoria can help us to make some sense out of the many aspects of contemporary life that, uh, that uh, follow from this most recent sort of cycle of uh, technological innovation that we can maybe date to the 1990s, uh, more or less. Uh, <clears throat> um, if it is helpful, that's the ultimate question uh, that we'd like to address. Um, MIT professor Sherry Turco, for example, recently noted that the person, that the internet has produced uh, a new sort of intimacy for the person that is alone in front of a screen at, on, on the internet. At the same time, she says, uh, it creates new solitudes in prior forms of intimacy, okay? Which I think is a nice way of indicating this ambivalent aspect of technology, the fact that it opens up new regions of experience of, uh, Im for the imagination on the one hand, at the same time that it shuts down other uh, Im important, you know, and up until recently socially important um, uh, areas as well. So that we be aware of this uh, uh, double-edged aspect of these uh, technologies. Um, now, I won't go into the long story of phantasmagoria. I just wanted to point out that it seems to me that there are two basic ways in which this idea was, uh, was uh, uh, theorized. Uh, <clears throat> one is uh, the, the classic Marxist sort of model that uh, that goes to Marxist, uh, Marxism, Marx uh, discussion of uh, commodity fetishism in the first chapter of Capital. Uh, and that's continued by Adorno in his famous writings on Wagner, the sort of father figure of the culture industry. And that model is a very critical one that aims at a sort of demystification. Phantasmagoria, the, the heart of phantasmagoria, according to Adorno, is this, uh, 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 as he calls it, the. Uh, 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 occultation of production by means of the outward appearance of uh, the product. Uh, you uh, deliberately hide how the product comes about, how it's produced, and so forth. This is a strong current of criticism, I think, that is uh, uh, present in architectural discourse, uh, uh, more or less explicitly. Uh, I think it goes straight into a kind of a cr critical view of contemporary practice. We could look at uh, Zaha Hadid's work. We could imagine uh, the sort of uh, ways in which uh, Zaha's uh, buildings uh, uh, seem to willfully sort of dissimulate the way they were made. Uh, they're meant to, uh, the, to, appear, to appear as sort of apparitions, uh, magical objects, so to speak. Uh, so these seamless surfaces, uh, these are aspects that I think of contemporary architecture that can go to this, uh, that are helpful to understand is in terms of this idea of phantasmagoria. Um, and of course, you're all familiar with Zaha's uh, remarks recently about the uh, thousand uh, workers who've died in uh, the building of her stadium in, in uh, uh, Qatar, is it? 
um, saying that's not my problem. You know, that's a way of her, a very succinct way of saying labor is not the concern of the architect, production, the material aspects of architecture are not uh, paramount. Uh, what counts is the, uh, is the visual effect, the visual emotional impact of the object. I think all of this is, is very much in line with this tradition of uh, analysis of uh, phantasmagoria that aims for uh, de demystifying the object, we can say. Now, alongside that uh, uh, way of looking at phantasmagoria, I think there's another uh, way which is uh, more sympathetic and more in line with sort of Benjamin's idea of, uh, of uh, imminent critique, we can say. So kind of a view from the inside, uh, more sympathetic in a sense, uh, <clears throat> uh, that does not assume that we can simply step out of a phantasmagoric sort of condition that we're in. Uh, that we somehow have to deal with it. It's a reality that we have to somehow come to terms with. Uh, and from this sort of uh, perspective, I think most of the papers that we're going to be hearing today really come from this Benjaminian sort of uh, tradition um, as applied to the city in particular, as, as applied to the way the city um, <clears throat> um, um, has an unconscious sort of uh, life that needs to be uh, uh, conjured up and exposed and made into a uh, an object of study and what I like to think of as a sort of a spectrograph spectrography of the city a, a study of the specters of the city uh, <clears throat> um, uh, it's a tradition of, uh, of writing that 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 explores the sort of uh, uh, forces of desire, greed, revolution, utopian change that are sort of the dark side of the city um, uh, that's hidden behind this sort of shiny external appearance. Uh, <clears throat> now this uh, way of looking at phantasmagoria might be seen as less critical and I think is open to a certain, uh, certain kind of uh, uh, sort of uh, critique as well. But um, uh, it naturally is drawn not so much towards the, the dream world of phantasmagoria or the sort of rational kind of explanation of that dream, but it's more drawn towards the communicating vessels, so to speak, between the rational, the irrational, the subconscious, and the conscious. This state of uh, awakening that we can assume is, a, is an extended moment uh, with a certain structure uh, that is neither sleep nor uh, uh, fully uh, awake condition uh, <clears throat> that we might think of maybe in terms of Badiou's idea of truth or, or of uh, an event that is a sparked by some kind of singularity. It has a, a he describes it as a as an interruption in the fabric of time. It's a momentary kind of moment. It's a moment of of, of awareness of consciousness. We can say. Uh, it is also a perspective that would lead us to look at how phantasmagorias can, can be interlaced and kind of follow, and embedded, or can be sort of embedded in, within each other, so to speak. Uh, it's a more complex kind of understanding of phantasmagoria that also uh, will eventually lead us to want to distinguish between better and worse, uh, truer and less true sort of phantasmagorias. Um, I should have said at the beginning that uh, this theme seems to us to apply particularly to our time, the time of, uh, of, uh, that we're presently uh, living in, uh, uh, that is uh, haunted by specters of all sorts. There are, some of them are real, you know, so climate change is real. Uh, some of them are totally concocted, like Mexicans, let's say, okay? Uh, <clears throat> uh, but it's a time of, uh, of uh, uh, where we, we, we we are haunted by many specters, and one definition of phantasmagoria is an assembly of specters or ghosts. Um, so it's this um, 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 spectral sort of history and aspect of the city that we want to explore in this uh, in this uh, uh, meeting, and uh, hopefully through that also touch on some of the topics that we address in our book. Um, <clears throat> Uh, so to be very, very quickly, to give us a sort of a, a program uh, for the day, we want to start with uh, Margaret uh, Cohen, who's going to how to plunge us into this topic of, uh, of the, uh, the, the, the dark side of, uh, of uh, the city or 
uh, the ghosts of architecture by looking at the Gothic imagination uh, from the Middle Ages uh, to the present. Then we have two, I think, presentations that will be uh, much more oriented towards the contemporary scene in architecture and what we might call the phantasmagorias of transit or the phantasmagorias of circulation, possibly. Uh, looking critically at, the, at architecture today from, from this perspective. Then we have a break and then uh, David Kishik will uh, bring us his perspective as a philosopher on architecture, philosophy, maybe some theology as well, uh, on the specter of language and, uh, and Babel. I'm not quite sure what his, uh, what his presentation will, will, uh, will, will be about. And then everything hopefully will be in some ways uh, 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 summed up in some sense with, by Graham Gillick, who is our um, uh, uh, keynote speaker, uh, who will talk about phantasmagoria and the sort of ambivalence and sort of the antinomies, or maybe the better word is uh, uh, the dualities that, uh, that, uh, that exist in this uh, idea, this concept of phantasmagoria, uh, including hopefully uh, if this is something that he can do, uh, showing us also how phantasmagorias can can arch, uh, generate sort of a, a radical sort of a, a questioning of an existing sort of state of things. And so uh, there will be a positive note that we will hopefully be able to end on. Uh, <clears throat> and if we can do that, that will be great because I think, as Benjamin said about um, uh, the surrealists, uh, uh, there's nothing more important than to win the energies of intoxication for the revolution. Okay, and this is what what uh, <coughs> phantasmagorias may be able to help us with. So I want to say a few last words about of thanks for the people that have uh, been involved in this uh, in this uh, uh, organizing this event. First, Mom, uh, Scott and um, uh, uh, Nancy Greenlay was a Dean of Research, who recognized the significance of the proposal, came through with funding. Uh, and especially, I want to thank the people in the architecture program, Tia, um, um, Kelly, I don't know where they are, Nicole, uh, who worked very hard to make uh, the poster, the, the publicity, uh, uh, the program in these last few days. And lastly, I need to acknowledge my friend, my co-conspirator, Nadia Lahiji, uh, which I'll catch, take an opportunity now to kind of introduce to you, because I don't think we scheduled anybody to introduce you, Nadia. It's like nobody's going to introduce me. So I'm going to say about Nadia that his, uh, his uh, 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 list of publications has become very, very dense in, uh, lately. Uh, he's uh, averaged one book a year from uh, 19, from 2014, and now he's up to three books a year. This 2016, he's got uh, three books, uh, The Adventures in the Theory of the Baroque and French Philosophy in Bloomsbury, um, Architecture and Phantasmagoria that he co-authored with me, uh, and the, another book that we partly participated in, uh, Can Architecture Be an Emancipatory Project? Dialogues on Architecture in the Left. All these three came out in 2016. So I'm going to just say one thing that I think is not nice, and I'm going to say it anyway. <laughs> Some of you will, uh, will remember Nadia was here. Uh, you'll remember he was uh, part of our faculty at Georgia Tech many, many years ago. And at that time, uh, the sort of unwritten rule and for a young faculty like me was the one that everybody referred to as a publish or perish, right? That was uh, the rule. But uh, as th time went by, there was another sort of rule that sort of crept in that, that said publish and perish, right? That means enough, it's not enough to publish, you can get tenure. Well, Nadir, based on his life story, I think gives us an illustration of another rule, perish and then publish. I think that's what Nadir has done. <laughs> and uh, uh, in any case, I, I expect to, to uh, that's continue. What ghosts do. I'm sorry? That's what ghosts do. That's what ghosts do, exactly. Well, and uh, I certainly look forward to many years of continuing collaborations with him. Thank you. So, Nadir. Thank you. So, I survived. I didn't perish before I come to Atlanta. It's physical. 
and I have to return the liberal's favor and also introduce him to you. But in a moment, we are running a little bit behind time, so I will be very short. Uh, welcome, thank you very much for attending. Those uh, faculty, my colleagues here, former, former colleagues, uh, not old colleagues, former colleagues here, and, and also at the, outside of the Georgia Tech. Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, uh, we, we are honored that, that our friends and colleagues uh, responded to our invitation uh, inside the United States, John Ackman, uh, Margaret Cohen, uh, and uh, uh, from outside uh, the coming, uh, well, David uh, Keshik also is in the United States, but also uh, from England, uh, Greg Gillock and uh, Douglas Spencer. So we are we're very happy and we thank them to respond to our invitation. Uh, and, and, and of course, as you have already noticed, uh, uh, is going to be interdisciplinary discussion around this uh, topic, which is a, uh, not a topic exclusively for us, uh, architects in architectural schools. So that, that, that's, I, I think that's the strength and, and, uh, and uh, exciting uh, uh, for, for this, uh, uh, for this uh, gathering. Uh, uh, so I also thank uh, Scott uh, to facilitate and support uh, uh, our event. And of course, Libero took the whole responsibility of working uh, on this for a long time. So uh, it, it, for, uh, I have to be very short and, and start uh, with our speakers. Uh, uh, only the, for the benefit uh, of, of those, uh, especially uh, students who didn't get a chance to take a look at our book, as Libero already briefly explained. Uh, I only want to bring your attention to one thesis that we have advanced in this book, but also uh, basically recently I, I came across another uh, a text by uh, one of the philosophers, Italian philosophers, that we have used and cited, quoted in our book, but unfortunately we missed. Uh, to quote, uh, to use one of his uh, uh, book, uh, Giorgio Agamben and Stanza. Uh, uh, so I came across that, and he said very interesting, a specific sense, a, a specific thing about the city uh, related to the, uh, the Phantasmagoria and the uh, uh, three universal exhibition. So, uh, and, and unfortunately, we could not, uh, w one of the Probably shortcoming uh, of shortcomings of our book is that we, we did not uh, include uh, uh, images uh, uh, because it's a kind of discussion and book that had to had to have uh, images. But uh, we ran out of money. Sorry, uh, we had to spend a lot of money to get images, as John Ackman, our colleague, knows how it was. So, uh, uh, so only very few uh, images. Uh, uh, so, uh, of course, Magic Lantern uh, is, is the beginning of, of uh, Robertson uh, the, in late 18th century, the, who invented uh, the word phantasmagoria. But I, I, I was told that before that by Libero in our discussion that a literary critic, even before Robertson, used uh, uh, the word phantasmagoria. And, and, and then uh, this, is the, this is one thesis that the, uh, we have uh, advanced in our book on, on the notion of the city that the city is a structure like a phantasmagoria, which is really an analogy that we have taken from a, a psychoanalyst by the name of Jacques Lacan, who said, Lang unconscious is a structured like language. So we analogically, metaphorically uh, use that to say that, uh, in a nutshell, to say that the city has an unconscious. Huh? which uh, goes to this definition that we have at last. So basically, uh, uh, and, and then of course, uh, again, uh, uh, going back to Giorgio Agamben and, and the source of uh, uh, three exhibition, Crystal Palace, on, in relationship to the uh, commodity fetish and phantasmagoria, because these two, as uh, Libero mentioned, on, in a Marxian text, and which comes to Walter Benjamin, these two terms are interrelated. On commodity fetish, what is commodity and what is commodity fetishism, and what is phantasmagoria. So uh, it is inside the Crystal Palace. You are probably from your uh, architectural history. You are quite familiar, 
and, and then second ex exhibition, Paris ex Exposition, 1867. Uh, and, and, and that's what, what they wrote in, in the famous uh, gig, uh, guide to the uh, uh, exhibition of second exhibition in Paris. And eventually, that's inside uh, again all these commodities uh, for, uh, uh, for in the, on display. Uh, and, and, and then a Paris Universal Exhibition, 1889, uh, which then Georgia Agamben says that the whole uh, city, not the exhibition itself. And this is what that uh, citation quotes in red, and then the blue is what uh, Georgia Agamben says, and I, and I think is, is quite uh, significant, and this actually supports our Again, the definition and the thesis that we have advanced uh, that the city is a structure like a phantasmagor. And, and we hope that uh, through presentations today and, and, and again our in panel discussion this afternoon, we will, we will have chance, more time to actually uh, explore. So uh, let me return uh, the favor of uh, Liberon Deriotti to him. I, I want to introduce him. So, <laughs> and, and then we we'll quickly go and, and start. Uh, so, uh, Libero uh, has been uh, the full professor of architecture here at the uh, College of Design and School of Architecture. I have to disclose a secret uh, to you. Don't tell anybody. I was in the search committee who hired, which we hired uh, Libero and Deriotti here. But don't tell anybody. So he basically directed the Georgia Tech uh, program in Paris, a successful uh, uh, program for 17 years, uh, actually from 1994 to 2011. Then, then uh, Libero probably is one of the few, very few uh, experts on situationist international inside our discipline, uh, which uh, began at that time when I was here, began substantial sort of research in, into the work of uh, situationist international, out of which the, the first uh, co-edited book, an, an anthology uh, entitled The Theory of Deriv, and, and uh, an object, situationist writings on, on, on the city. And then after that, uh, uh, another uh, book, uh, the first one he co-edited, and, and uh, after that, the book entitled Situationist, Architecture, Politics, Urbanism, uh, which uh, was published as a catalog of exhibition uh, in MACBA uh, in Barcelona. If you go to Barcelona, the museum of Richard Meyer Museum uh, in, in the old uh, city. And then he published Le Grand Jou à Venir, uh, uh, which is, uh, again, a documentation on, in French, a book is in French. Uh, you don't have the bilingual English in it. Uh, okay. So the uh, documents uh, of situationist, and and then uh, after that the book uh, titled uh, Walter Benjamin A l'Architecture, which was basically a, a, a big conference in Paris, in which I participated. Uh, so the proceeding of, of that uh, conference basically was on Walter Benjamin. And uh, besides this, uh, Libero has uh, uh, published in uh, various uh, prestigious uh, journals from October Magazine to Gray Room to Lotus International and JAE. On this note, I, I should stop and uh, I introduce our speaker. Let, uh,